We all good? This Tom, is this Tom, is it. Lens cap still on that one, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is all very exciting being back together, isn't it? it? Feels like we're actually back in in an office, which is uh, feels like years, literally years ago since we were sat together. Years ago. In I told Hallie I was on the way into the studio. She couldn't believe it. It's insanely exciting. Um, well, it has been a very, very, very exciting couple of months, um, and also a ridiculous couple of months, really. I mean, if you'd have told us. Back end of last year, we'd have gone through all of what we've gone through. What are we now? 6th of April, 7th of April. I mean, we would never have believed it. Uh, we would have loved to have thought we'd have done it, but never have believed it. I mean, let's try and rewind to pre-December, like why we made the decision we did to to take on the, uh, the private equity investors. Um, because it was so much lead up and so many different conversations that we had as a three about what we wanted to do for the next chapter. Um, but it all happened very, very quickly. And also kind of explains why we haven't been vlogging or we haven't been creating content for the last four or five months. So Aaron, yeah, what, what, what were the conversations going into 2021? Well, really it was, you know, we were experiencing a level of growth in 2020, particularly the last six months of 2020, that was just insane. Like, like doubling month on month and just to the point where we could see that the market had taken a real leap forward so we're starting to see budgets that we weren't seeing before the business is really flying in the last year and the conversation we started to have was it's getting to a point where these numbers are getting really big and being approached by virtually every p in the market all the vcs the you know a few of the the holding companies and but that is that is one thing that's always surprised us we've we've obviously Where been are running the holding the, companies? yeah we, we've been growing this business for six years now and we've always said to each other oh at some point all the holding groups are going to come to us and go we want to have a conversation yeah and it's just never materialized and that has always been a massive shock to me personally well they've missed it they've they've and I don't just mean, oh, they've missed it a little bit. They have missed it by three or four years and yeah. just, just completely missed it as a trend. Um, now, right now, because of conversations that we're having, I know that the networks are very, very seriously looking at, at influencer and, and the social space. And, you know, you, I've got no doubt that you'll see a load more ridiculous things happen. Um, you know, going back to why do we do it is... The business is growing at such a pace that if we didn't do a deal right now, someone would be offering to buy the whole business for an amount that it would be very difficult for us to to say no to. Um, the deal we did was a minority deal where we, we retain the majority of each of our shares. Yes, we've cashed out a you know a good amount of money and protect you know we've secured ourselves and everything else financially going forward, but certainly from my point of view and i think i speak for all of us the reason we did it was we don't want the journey to end for us to be an influence you know to, to be doing 50 million revenue this year and be looking ahead and thinking there's no reason we can't do 250 300 in the next three years that was that was a big stretch even for us yep. a year ago and now that's probably our base level scenario there are scenarios where you know in three years time we're doing a billion a year so yeah and i think uh, in our journey the two of us have been quite different to nick's mainly because we had the experience of being in the big office a uh, hundred people around us every day um whereas nick and then obviously coming out of that straight into lockdown we've be, we've been apart for a year and a bit and then nick's had a three-year stretch where it's just been a completely different beast like how do you feel coming out the back of an office that was like five people, then it got to like 10, 15, and now a year of just being on your own and not experiencing like what we've experienced, which is the same sort of hyper growth. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, when I thought about the journey of of the company, we kind of knew there would be a transaction, um, there would be a moment, and then it would kind of build to a second moment. And I think the, the key thing for me is that as you say, my experience has, has been completely different. I went to the US. I built an office from scratch. It was me and one other person in a WeWork at the point that we had 100 people in the London office. And then I suppose I returned in September um, having built a successful US office. As a conquering hero. As a conquering hero. <laughs> and and the, US, then, the US was a massive part. The US growth is a massive like prove point for how much the business can scale, right? And that has been a huge, huge... Uh, stake in the ground for us to be able to go okay well look we can do this in the US from nothing 
look how much we can do continually in the US, but also in so many other markets globally. Yeah, and that was a key thing throughout all the conversations with, uh, we'll, we'll come on to it, but we obviously did the deal with inflection. Um, we did have conversations with a few different P's. Um, and obviously a key, a key part of that conversation is market growth. And what was really interesting is what we knew is that the US market is um, further ahead, more mature than the UK market. And the fact that we proved that we could go into that market with a model that translated to the US. We started winning big clients and really turned a lot of our UK clients into proper global clients has been the big transition. But we're 30 days on from doing the deal, just over 30 days on from doing the deal. What did you expect it to feel like post-transaction? versus what the reality is oh, that's a good question because it, it like these sort of things when you start a business as an entrepreneur you know a, a transaction of any level is like the dream um and you know there'll be people watching this that might have transacted part of their business or fully or that's what they're trying to achieve and i think people are very rarely honest about what that whole process is like we went through a roller coaster process unbelievably expressed uh, through the through a period which was you know normally six months nine months we did it in thirty days from we didn't even meet the party that were the going to be the investors in us until thirty two days before they transferred the money um, for the shares so like a huge huge effort from all parties but there's this kind of reality versus what people's expectations are and what what, what do you feel like in terms of how it married up. I think relief is probably the biggest feeling right is that moment of okay we've done this like no, whatever happens now whatever happens going forward we go and i have no doubt that we're going to go from strength to strength but whatever happens we've we've done a great job and and we've actually been successful and you know we've we've benefited from it directly and our families have and you know i've secured my kids future and everything else and I'm certainly not gonna be blase about that it's a huge thing and you know, I, I'm delighted every now and you know, I still catch myself in moments just being like, can't believe it's real. Can't believe that, that, you know, this is what we've done. But nothing changed, you know, nothing, no. nothing really changed. The next day, we're all just back at our desks working on the same stuff that we we're working on prior to that. I feel as motivated, if not more than I did previous. And it's very easy, like when, when you don't have money. It's very easy to think that money, you know, if you had money, it's the solution to everything. And it, don't get me wrong, it is to an extent, right? We live in a capitalist society, you need money. But, you know, once you're over a certain level of pay grade, which we were probably already over anyway on our salaries and things, what really changes, you know? I think the other thing there is, obviously, we closed the deal in a lockdown. Yeah, and that's and so weird. I remember we that that first day. Yeah, so we haven't we, gone to Vegas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, we're all like, wow, we've we've worked incredibly hard over the last six years, but insanely hard over the last five weeks. And we all met up and celebrated. But what can we do? We're all locked in our homes. Like there's not really. Even now we're coming out of lockdown. The things I really look forward to doing are playing football with my mates and five aside. And nothing really has changed. It does give me a sense of, you know, it it does give you strength right the the that that feeling that like what have we got to lose like let's go for it let's really go for it go and create i'm not interested in actually taking goat from 50 million revenue to 150 million rev like three are you are you feeling okay, that in, in, as well as that the macro feeling of being de-risked are you guys feeling it in the kind of day-to-day -day moments are you going into big pitches or big calls and feeling a little less stressed and a little less affected by the day-to-day -day stress. No. I think I am to some extent. No, see, my my care about our standards hasn't changed at all because it's not about, it's not actually about the money. I think you are right, though. Re relaxation, like, it's not uh, relaxing to the point where we don't want to achieve. Like, the ambition is certainly not gone at all because we know what's in front of us. But I do understand what you mean. Like, you know, it it's less life and death than it was before. And I, I almost mean the pressure I put on myself. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. Yeah, in yeah. those moments, not the pressure I would put the, the rest of the team under. Yeah. I, I still would hold the team to the same standard. But when I go into a presentation that normally maybe it will keep me up a little bit the night before, I'm finding that I'm able to convince myself like, you know, what's the worst that can happen? 
Yeah, I I think one of the big things I've felt is a confidence because of the DD we've just gone through. Yeah, that right? is a major like, thing that people don't understand. And I was very yeah. surprised. However much you hear about the DD process, I was quite shocked at how detailed it was. Oh, insanely so. I mean, there was, a, there was an ongoing joke we were saying throughout the thing that I, you know, I kept saying to the guys, I'm, I'm half expecting for one of them to be in bed with my wife and for them to say, oh, sorry, it's just part of the deal. You know, we just... That's Aaron's favourite We've got to get to... <laughs> there, was a, there was a 10-day period. But honestly, it was. It was like, insane. It was insane. It was, We're doing it was... multiple hour personality tests each. They're going through DD with all the influencers, with all the supply, with everybody. But we had to obviously yeah. do everything. And again, I come back to, you know, that process, people are normally achieving over three to six months. Normally the, the whole, you know, you, you court the potential investors... You make your decision with who you're going to go for. Maybe you're making a decision on two or three that you go into DD with. You then go for a DD process, which is probably about three to six months. Uh, and then you make a decision and go through the legals, which is probably another couple of months. It's a long process. We did everything simultaneously for 32 days, which is outrageous. But it also put a microscope on every single aspect of the business. And I think that's exactly why I feel more relaxed because it doesn't matter how much you believe in the business that you're running and how much you believe in the product you have, until it's been totally third party verified, then you don't know how much is a sell and how much is the truth. Just because you get lost, and especially we've been doing it for six years, get lost in exactly what what we're trying to sell, what the product is, what we're good at, what we're not good at. When someone comes in and literally does every single piece of digging into our business, and, and I don't think it's it's easy to express how much and how many questions people ask. Like, it was yeah. outrageous. And this is EY, PwC, you know, the yeah, biggest consultants minds, in the world. Yeah, the top minds in this, in this industry are going through, like, line by line of and every a lot of them thing. had no idea about influencer. Yeah. It's not an industry that they had done DD on before, for the most part. Yeah. So I think there was an extra degree of scrutiny and a, a, a kind of educational piece that had to come at the beginning before they could even get under the surface. I mean, we were told by lots of advisors. It was categorically impossible that we could do Categorically impossible. I'm yeah. not saying that they're, they're, they're wrong, they're good advisors, but they were wrong with us. And, you know, we were very clear going into this year that we're going to do a transaction before March, before March the 1st. Um, and the significance of the de- that, that date is what? Why did we want, why do we set us, because that's really what, we turned into 2021 and we, that was the date. Second, well, there was third two, of March, right? There was two sides to it. One, we knew the speed of growth we were on and the value of doing a deal quickly. And, you know, we, you know, we haven't been doing a lot of marketing. We've, you know, you guys were still plugged into the business seriously, it, but probably even 50% of your time dragged into the deal, probably like 100% of my time dragged into the deal. A lot of, you know, our CFO and COO's time and a lot of other, you know, key leaders in the business dragged into it. If that takes six to nine months, it does affect your day-to-day. So we went into it knowing that a shorter process is better. Simultaneously, there were rumours of a capital gains tax um, change in that was going to come in in the new budget on March 2nd um, or March 3rd. That didn't happen in the end. So then we were, once we started having conversations, we then fixed that date and we ran towards it. You know, I'm, I'm personally a believer in, you know, if if something's good enough or it's compelling enough, people will move and we'll we'll get over timelines and things like that. But you know, we were told categorically it was impossible to complete a transaction like this in 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 the time that we did. We just didn't take no for an answer. Um, you know, I think we got a good deal. We probably could have, have have done it at a higher valuation if we'd have wanted to go down the six to nine month process. Um, but we didn't. We decided that you know better for us to do this minority deal now secure ourselves and then really go again for you know at least another if not multiple more more sales beyond it um but you've got to trust your you know that that would certainly be advice i'm so glad that we trusted ourselves and we trusted our instincts and we didn't listen to people that were supposedly experts in something but actually you know didn't really understand our business you know you can't find a faster growing agency than us there isn't one anywhere so Anyone that's sort of coming to you going, oh, well, we think you're like this. We can do something similar to that. My immediate reaction to all of it is, but we're miles better than that. We're growing at three times their speed. We're in a much hotter space. We're this, that, and the other. So, you know, someone will come to you and say, oh, this is the standard, you know, eight to 12 times your EBIT, whatever it may be. But actually, 
the agency that everyone wants is at 20x rather than at 10x and like i've always felt like we're that we're that different thing and you know once we took it into our own hands and we're able to have those conversations directly with people we we're able to show other people that hey we are this different thing i think it's fair to say at the beginning of the whole process that deadline was very real and we yes. that deadline was fixed because there was a genuine fear of cgt going up mm -hmm. and then kind of gradually the rumors suggested it wouldn't change and then and right, at the end, more of a right at the end, it, it felt like it was going to change. Yeah, exactly. We had a two week period in the middle where we're like, ah, oh, so we can take the foot off a gaff a bit because it feels like it's going to be OK. But we saw very much uh, from an internal perspective, an external perspective, we were very much beating the drum. It's going to change, going to change I mean, to, to force all parties to keep moving. At pace. And in the end, we, we did a commercial deal with inflection whereby, you know, we de-risked ourselves on any potential CGT change anyway which was smart and made us all feel very relaxed and forced them to get a move on. And actually, we had a hilarious moment the day the deal was done where we were all watching Rishi's budget and not hoping there was a CGT change because it wouldn't affect us. But, you know, that was, that was a memorable moment. We were all watching the budget separately at home and kind of, you know, normally you would looking care out at for all. That, yeah. right. But if you were to, I mean, you're the most conservative about the three of us. If you have no, go, <laughs> you go back to like middle of January and the, and the three of us discussing what we're trying to achieve. And also when we first walked into the first private equity business that we actually had a our first in-person meeting in 12 months we had with a private equity firm in Knightsbridge in about the 28th of January. That was our mm -hmm. first ever conversation with a private equity firm properly. Um, and we closed the deal on the 2nd of March with another one. Um, when we walked into that room, how realistic did you personally think it was that we were going to get the deal done in March? Um, not very. I, well, first thing is we didn't go to market. So this initial P came to us. Um, and we probably went in. I mean, I was probably as excited just to see you guys and, yeah, and yeah. spend a full day in person more than anything else. It was great as well. It was really was like getting really the lovely to offices. We spent three full days from nine to seven. Well, we hadn't done that as a three because we're effectively uh, with all these things you're selling, right? You're selling the business yeah. in terms of like you know being it up, focusing on the good points. All because I was things. in the US. I yeah, we had done, done that for three with, years. The three of us for three years. Yeah. Um, so I think I went into that more excited about, and also excited to learn. I've you know been involved in raising some money, but not really directly. Never, none of us have ever been involved in a P deal, and I'd say I've learned a huge amount over the last three months. But in that three days alone, you know, it, they were doing a lot of their DD in person because they knew they'd have to move quickly. But it's just a completely different language. The whole PE language, you know, there were certain terms that I'd have to like look up or ask you guys what they were. And I think for all of us, it was just a, there was also a hilarious moment on day two where they made us an offer and there was a kind of dragon's den moment in the room <laughs> where, um, you know, we're kind of negotiating in real time and, and we were speaking to the other firm and we've been very um, transparent around that. And there was an actual moment where, you know, we're in discussions and they said, OK, we're going to have to step outside and have a conversation. And the three of them left the room. And the, three of, the us corner, three of us just sitting left in the room looking at each other. And there was, like, a laptop, there was a laptop in the corner. And we all just looked at each other and went, if that's still on. <laughs> we just yeah. started, started, we had we the just, light, the camera was on yeah, on the we laptop. Just, we just started texting each other in the room for like five minutes, not speaking yeah, at we all. We couldn't say anything. I think Ernst and Young were on the call who were representing them. And we all just had to sit there like texting each other. And then they came back in. Um it was just a very odd few days. And my girlfriend, obviously having spent all day every day with me, knowing I hadn't left the house, was equally excited. I'd come back every night and she'd be like, what happened? What, you know, what was it like? And it was just a really dramatic few days. And I guess we had an initial offer on the table. We, we probably would have done that deal. Like We liked the guys. You know, one week before, none of us thought we'd do a deal at all you know, in, in the next few months. Um, well. And then, well, <laughs> we, we can go into that. Um, and by the second day, we had an offer. And by the third day, we had another P who had essentially made us an offer without meeting us and said, come and meet us. So we did this full third day, exhausted by the end of it. Well, yeah, well, yeah, straight it, from... It was nine... Those three days in Knightsbridge were 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. in yeah. one Having not seen another human room. for a year, it was, it was mentally exhausting. 
but we finished the third day at kind of 6 p.m we actually had a beer with the first pe i think they were sort of doing an assumptive close um and then we went straight from there to meet uh inflection in a rented boardroom um in green park which was again very exciting it was a very grand room i always remember that room very yeah. grand probably enormous a table big enough for 50 people yeah a banquet right. table and there was seven of us mm-hmm. and we were probably about uh probably six seven foot away from the person on the other side of the table yeah disconcertingly far away from everyone else um, and by that point, we had um, a third party who'd brought in inflection to us. Well, let's name them because they've done, they did a great job for us. Yeah. So the, the actual advisors we ended up using was a company called Spectrum CF, um, Mark Farlow. And, and, you know, I certainly couldn't recommend them highly enough. We, we essentially made, they made us an offer we couldn't refuse after we got on the, the first Friday. Deal. Yeah. yeah. How did the, how did so that we, come about? We they got, an they offer, got in touch with us. At the we got an offer on the, on the Thursday from the first private equity firm. We then got, we, Aaron had a call with Mark from Spectrum on the Thursday night. And we said, look, we're going to go with this private equity firm on Monday. Unless someone else comes to the table. And he said, Bye, give Monday. me the weekend. He yeah. said, you've got a great business. I, at the pizza, I had a chat with Mark and he said, you know, when I first heard about you, I thought you were doing X million of revenue and i found out it was your projected ebitda for the year and my whole perspective changed like i didn't think agencies in this space were doing those kind of numbers yeah which is why he so confidently said give me till friday i'll have another few parties on the table and if you do a deal with one of them you can pay me extra. Yeah, he he, so took, it, he took it on, on friday and he had three people at the table on sunday night two that of, was two of the made his offers on monday yeah it was he did an unbelievable job um so we had two two calls on the monday and we didn't have the call of inflection until the Tuesday. Mm-hmm. And then we had our th- our third day with the first private equity firm on the Thursday. That was the one that went until six. We had the beers and they went to inflection. The first time we ever met them. We'd only spoken to them for an hour on the, hour on the phone. Mm-hmm. It's quite funny because Mark and the Spectrum guys kind of, they've obviously set up the situation. They really want all parties to get along with each other. He bought... 20 beers that he picked up from Tesco on the way. They're all kind of warm beer bottles yeah. hanging around. He ordered takeaway pizzas that were freezing cold by the time they arrived. It, was, re- so it was glamorous many. in that it was in this incredible room, but it was also so basic in terms of how we were all brought It was together. like a student night in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but again, we were so excited because we hadn't left the house. Yeah, exactly. And and those guys, as soon as those guys walked in, because we'd spent, uh, <clears throat> we spent three days in... I think even the the guys themselves would admit a corporate style private equity firm. Yeah. And the guys walked in from inflection. We're like, okay, that's already just from a, like a, a culture fit it felt more likely that we were going to get on. And then, you know, obviously going to the conversation still very much that we thought we're going to go with the other guys because we'd already got the, the offer on the table, basically done 50, 60% of the DD just in the room. And then we just got chatting with these guys at Inflection and thought, um, okay, right. These feel like the guys that can actually do something with us. They're like-minded. I remember leaving, leaving the, that first meeting. And before either of you said anything, I just looked at both of you and thought, okay, well, that's... We all like, smiled at each other and thought... You don't need to yeah. say it. Like, it yeah. was just, I just knew what you were about to say. And that we spent three hours with them and we didn't need to do any selling. Mm-hmm. Like, they openly admitted... They'd done. They'd looked at our investment deck. They'd looked at the numbers. They'd missed out on a couple of other businesses like Gymshark that have been driven by influencer. They'd done all the DD on those businesses, and it was just a chat. We just chatted about life, got to know each other. By the end, I think one of us was like, "Well, do you not want us to tell you a bit more about the business and the numbers?" And they just said, "No, not at all. This is just a chance to get to know you as people. Seem to have passed that test. So tomorrow we'll send." A an offer. offer over. And we all said, all right, fair enough. And at that point, we left and thought, okay, well, they're probably our guys, but we, we still hadn't had an offer in writing like we had with the other guys. And yeah, we, we thing, weren't sure it was going to come. The one thing that we have learned during this experience is that it is not done until it's done. Yeah. But, I mean, so many things change. And to be fair to inflection, nothing changed. And I think that's a big thing that we had to make super clear to everybody in the process. If something changes, we're out because it just it just it's not worth it for us. So the the barometer 
I think it's worth saying for us throughout the whole process in terms of how likely this was going to happen, was to happen, was Nick Martin, our CFO. Yeah. At various intervals, we would say to Nick Martin, what percentage are you sure this is going to happen? And he was always insanely low. Even after we left that room of inflection, we were walking down Green Park. We said to Nick, like, oh, this is great. They're going to make an offer. Is this going to happen? I think he said 10% chance and we were all like oh come on yeah. <laughs> and gradually across the plus. five weeks yeah. even the day before we, we actually signed the deal i think it was like 70 percent yeah well he's yeah he, he's definitely the most conservative even out of the four of us uh so like but those guys felt right but why why else aaron why else did did we go with those guys like why what else do we think that those guys can add why also, they, I mean, another important thing is we've done a minority deal and most private equity firms will do a majority deal. They'll take 70, 80 percent of the business. They'll give the 20 percent back to management and then they'll go and sell again. And the idea is that they sell within two to five years. Yeah. Why do we have inflection and why do we do a minority deal? Well, we did a minority deal because we know that this is going to be worth, you know, five, six hundred, a, a billion quid in the next two or three years. Yeah. And so. You know, I want to benefit from that. And we want control. So we yeah. still have control of the business. Yeah, exactly. We still have board control. We we, but we know what we've got, right? So now and that was super important to get off board control. Like we yeah. we we knew we wanted day to day management control, but board control is also very very important for us. I don't believe that there's anybody who can run our business better than us. So we're not looking for someone to come in and tell us how to do things. However, there are areas of our business. You know, maybe we decide to IPO. Maybe we decide to, you know, to sell to one of the big networks. Um, you know, who knows what we decide well, to do. Well, their specialty think, is exiting businesses. Exactly. You know, and, and there, I think when it comes to that, they can really, really help us. I think they have a lot of experience in large D2C, brand, D2C brands. They've got five and a half billion under management. That comes with a huge amount of expertise, whether it's from a... You know, they, they have CFO groups and CEO groups and CMO groups and lots of things where they're sharing data. But for me, the biggest reason I wanted to go with inflection is not because I think they can materially push GOAT forward. I think we can materially, can materially push GOAT forward and they can help us do that. But it's because I, I like them as humans. Yeah. I thought that... Well, they're you know, business partners now, really. That they is are. the they are we exactly have to that. work with them in the same way as the three of us have worked over the last five years. We had to like them. Yeah, and the three guys that we deal with are all under thirty-five and get the space. Are social natives, are smart, and not, you know, um, you know, have had things handed to them. These are these are people that really get it and have grafted and have and are, are like-minded to us. And and I get I get the sense that they're individually at a similar point in in their personal journeys mm -hmm. uh, they're obviously the really smart young up-and-coming guys within the PE world yeah similar to how we hire like we don't want to go and hire 40 year old business directors from Mediacom because they do things in a certain way we'd go and run we'd hire a senior account manager from a smaller agency who's maybe late 20s and has what we feel to be a much higher ceiling yeah feels like they fit that kind of mold in the way we do things. I mean, we're as a disruptor, it's very difficult to bring the experience in because we're doing something completely new, right? Completely new. And so, you know, it's like the invention of the car, right? That there will have been experts at how to build horse and carriages for the last 50 years. But if the new if Ford went and hired one of them, they're not a lot of use to them, right? They actually need the 16-year-old kid who's been you know, figuring it out in his garage sort of stuff. Like that's... First Aaron Shepherd analogy of the day. <laughs> I feel like we should play a drinking game where every analogy <laughs> or we, we have a sip. The, the big thing for, for us, I think, is just we've still, and this might sound difficult to believe for other people, but we still have barely scratched the surface. Like I, I think we, there's every chance we 10x from here in the next three years. And I think we could 50x in the next five. You know, and that sounds nuts but there are agencies out there doing five, 10 billion a year. And I'll tell you now, we are better than them. We provide a better service. We give better results. We know how to do this in the space that we're working in better than they do. And this industry is growing faster than any other and this industry, industry in, in terms of marketing. And they're going to lose those budgets and people like us are going to take them. And that, that, that's it is, 
you know, if I felt like we were anywhere near that sort of capacity, we'd all be looking to get out. We are years and years and years away, years away. And it, it's, that's the opportunity. The opportunity every day for me continues to get bigger and bigger. All right, if I look at what the opportunity was at the start of 2020 to what it is at the start of 2021, it's unimaginably different for us, right? As, as you can see, what one client could spend with us has gone from, you know, maybe four or five million to 15, 20 in the space of 12 months, right? And, yep. you know, will it go to 50, 60 in the next 12 months? Yeah. Yeah. Will it go to 150? Yeah. Uh, you know, the, we just have to keep doing what we're doing, have to keep delivering what we're delivering. But the bottom line is every time a big brand spends money with us, they get better results than when they spend it with someone else. And I don't just mean other influence from agencies. I mean, every other agency on the planet, you know, and that's, that's the reason that our accounts grow so much. That's the reason the pace grows so much. The rest of the influencer agencies haven't got the same model as ours and they're, they're suffering that. But over the next couple of years, people will start to latch onto this and we're going to see this become a, go from being a couple of billion a year to a hundred billion a year. And that I still think most people in the industry do not see that. At what, all. What, I think the lots of people watching will will want to know what's changed, what's going to change. Like there'll be people who work for Goat watching this. There'll be people who maybe want to work for Goat watching this and and be a part of this next chapter. There'll be people maybe our clients are watching this. Um, what do you say to them in terms of what is going to happen in the next twelve months, and then why is that or is that going to be different to what's happened in the last twelve months? Well, I think the basics of our business will always be the same, and that is to make every dollar or every pound work in the maximum possible way for our clients, to guarantee results to them up front so that we de-risk the client in the first place and then put all of the onus on optimization on us. And that model of guarantee, oh, we've set the bar, you know, the line in the sand, we have to cross it or we fail, means that we will just keep optimizing until we cross that line. So... From a day-to-day -day point of view, I don't think anything has changed. Our whole ethos is our standards are exceptionally high. We keep them exceptionally high. The service we provide is exceptionally high. We always go and over-deliver. Those are built into everything we do with every campaign. And I don't see any of that going anywhere. What will happen, I believe, is brands will realize that they should have social first approaches instead of having you know you've got a hundred million dollar ad budget you're going to go and spend 40 million on tv 25 million over here 10 million over here and 5 million on social you should spend 40 million on social and design the rest of your marketing to work for that social right and the brands that are doing that the gym sharks of this world are killing it and the brands that aren't i mean christ i went into top shop four years ago right told them you have to innovate. You have to go online. What are you doing? You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. And they went under this year. And I've seen all the people that have left Topshop saying, oh, we did everything we could. You know, we did this. What a brilliant team we have. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, no, what absolute nonsense. Like you, you were given numerous opportunities to save your business. Not just by us. Not just by us. And through your own ignorance, stupidity, whatever it is you want to call it, you made the wrong you know, the wrong decision, you fail because of that. Topshop could have saved themselves if four or five years ago when we first approached them, they changed their model, gone down the social first route, they'd be one of the biggest well, yeah, look brands at, look in the at, UK right look now. Look at all of the other fashion brands who've done very well out yeah. there. Yeah. All of ASOS, these, all exactly. I'm sick of the sympathy. I've got no sympathy at all. All these, high, all these retail brands going under now, it's their own fault. It is their own fault. For the last five or 10 years, mm -hmm. everybody's been screaming at them you need to go fit more than 50% online, more than 50%. There are still major retailers now advocating to be 20% online and 80% retail. I think retail. if you look at Inflection's portfolio, it, it is kind of representative of that. They're all D2C brands growing insanely quickly. Um, and actually, one of the benefits is we can be plugged into all of those because our model is perfect for driving revenue for all those companies. But you're right. I think the other interesting thing is we in terms of what's going to change we've obviously we told our team about the deal um and we're i think there was a kind of assumption and maybe there still is from the market that we've done this private deal is the money going to go back into the business and it's not um but we're a very profitable business anyway and so we're still investing 
in all of the areas that are going to help us do all the things we need to do. I think yeah, that's, that's build a, the CRM, yeah. offices abroad, all those things we're still going to do aggressively. I think it just gives us a bit more belief and de risk as we In said. lots of these deals, maybe not so much in private equity, but in lots of exits and, and, and people watching this will be kind of putting that this into that um, bucket. Like lots of exits see the founders step away, either mm -hmm. fully or to an extent. We're obviously not at all not even to any percentage. If anything, we're more in than we ever have been. Um, what do you say to people who are watching good, like a, who who might see us as, as maybe that? I mean, the, the key thing really is that it's a, it's a minority deal. So Inflection own a minority percentage of the business. We still own a big enough chunk each um, to be incentivized to build towards a bigger exit. Um, and the, the, the other key thing is obviously the impact of the, the where we are in our overall journey, right? COVID impacted us badly for two, three months. We had an amazing back end of 2020. We know that 2021 is going to be enormous from an, a revenue and EBIT point of view. And all the kind of macro market shifts um, lead us to believe that the next two, three, four years are going to be enormous. So why would we jump off now? Makes no sense. And relationships within the business like how does it change our day-to-day -day involvement are we gonna run the business any differently are we gonna be as involved with everyone in the business like what what's actually going to change from that point of view? i don't think anything changes at all um at all the no the, there's nobody there's no senior execs coming into the business to to go and do anything like that no one is going to change who they're reporting to our three roles are exactly the same as they were three months ago and won't change um, we're continuing to be three equal co-founders, continuing not to have a CEO, continuing with the, all the same ethos and decision making that we've had for for the last six years. We still control the board, so we're still reporting to ourselves on the board. There are just other people on the board with us. But, you know, for me, I think it's really important. And one of the things I was most excited about this deal was that nothing changes day to day because... We don't need it to. We, we've got this, not to be, not to be arrogant about it at all. Because if we make, if we don't keep our efforts and our standards at one hundred percent, we'll fail. But we have got this nailed down. We know what we're doing here. We haven't got a problem that we need fixing. We haven't got a bottleneck in the business. We haven't got, you know, lots of businesses do right. Yet they they'll go out in situations like this because they need to go and buy a new factory to keep this in or they need to go and buy a new machinery. Well, one of the reasons the we were able to do the deal so quickly or the DD process so quickly is because our business is so clean. It's already built yeah. for this stuff. Exactly. And it doesn't need anything. And that's clear. And I think that the reason that the investment thesis was so strong, not just for inflection, but for others, was because we just got to keep doing what we're doing, mm -hmm. right? It's That's it. And the industry speaks for itself. Yeah. How how do you get to 10xing the business? Well, just keep doing what you're doing and you should get there. And, you know, maybe you can do some other things and go and 30 exit, 40 exit, but just keep doing what we're doing. We've got it. I suppose the other the other part of that question is, in terms of what's going to change, is how are inflection going to help us? And the key thing really is they're going to help us structure the business from from now to be as well positioned for that next exit as possible. Yeah. There's no point trying to position ourselves for that in three years time. We're already having conversations around that, which is very exciting. Um, also, they have all these other DTC brands that they can plug us into and they have a presence in all of the other major territories that we potentially will want to expand into. Um, so it, it, things aren't gonna change. You know, the board structures change. We're gonna add a chairperson which is great, but really it's that kind of top level, long term strategic insight that we just don't know enough about. One thing that is going to change massively is our content output, Hell which yeah. is why we're sat here. Um, we have taken a studio. We haven't got any offices left uh, across the world. No London headquarters, no New York office. We've got no Singapore office. Um, but we do have a studio in London, um, which is where the three of us are based, uh, where the video team were based. Uh, so we thought, this is the idea. We're going to get a studio. We're going to get multiple sets. And we're going to go back to creating content. Now, it won't be the vlog of old and people will be watching this and going, oh, no, it's not the vlog how it was with the, with the office and the energy. But we've got loads of different formats that we think will add value to LinkedIn or YouTube or Instagram, wherever we, we decide to put them. Um, 
I'm excited to get back and doing this as part of the routine. It was such an enjoyable couple of years documenting the journey. And I think also being able to, you know, chapter where we've just, uh, what we've just achieved and look back on what got us there for that 18 months of daily vlogging. Um, it's weird is, for me because I, you were watching I it like wasn't a, ever like in all that content, right? <laughs> so like, finally I can actually come in and hang out with all these guys. Um, but for me, it was odd because I was watching from afar and being in that massive London office, I left for New York pretty much the day we entered the office and I came back after it was closed. So there's like a big chapter of goat history that I don't really feel not not part of, but my experience was just completely different to you guys. Yeah, and we, we've got this podcast studio, uh, which will be doing loads of different things with all sorts of different members of the team. The three of us want to talk more about the business and how we're how we're doing things in the industry, but just be as try and try and be as candid as we have been uh, for the last sort of 40 minutes. Um, but also loads of other uh, strands of content with the team, because I think that one of the massive positives from the vlog was uh, one of the differentiators from us versus other people who've created content on LinkedIn is it's not just about us. And that's always been so important when we've been thinking about the content is, yeah, obviously people are going to be interested in our journey uh, as founders, but people are also very interested in the relatable aspects of other people across the business. And there's going to be a massive, massive focus on that too. Um, are you as excited as me to get back in the studio, back behind the mic, Matt running around with a camera in your face? Well, I'll be honest, Matt. I don't think anyone can be excited as, as you are. <laughs> um, I'm just delighted to be able to get out of the house. Tom Freeman's got his headphones on. Matt's running around. Lights are breaking. We're nailed into this room. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I am delighted. It's great. To, I've just been watching a few of the um, a few of the different um, sort of strands that the guys have decided to put together. Yeah. A few of the, God, what's it called? Pilots. Pilots thank you. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm, it's it's just excites me to get back. It's to get back fun. To it, like to we've honest. always wanted to be fun to watch, uh, entertaining but informative, serious when we need to be but try and take you on the real journey and, and we're going to just do it in a different way because we don't have an office to vlog every day. We now need to show the journey in a, in a different way. We need to show what it's like to be a new hire in a business that's totally virtual. And we've got a format about that where Matt takes them uh, a new hire through a, an induction call. And that's a bit of fun. And then you've got things like this, which are a bit more candid and serious about the, about the, about the business and what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to do. And then we've got, you know, things related to social. And I'm sure we'll be doing lots of things to do with breaking news because there's you know, opportunities to do that all the time. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to get content back out there and take back over LinkedIn. That, that, that is our territory. Do you know what, or, or Pete, a lot of people have asked what the impact of creating content is. I think one, one example that really highlights it from the whole transaction process is that the first PE that we went to see um, you know, we've won a lot of business oh, God, we can yeah, tie. Yeah, oh, we've shit, won a lot of business yeah. that we can tie back to the vlog. But the first PE we walked in, first day, first in person meeting we've had in a year, and the guys from the firm came in and said, Oh my God, one of the girls at reception loves the vlog. Apparently, they know exactly who you guys are. So it's just insane that even in terms of securing a PE deal. I mean, it, it I, I had come slipped with some time. cash. Before, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But we've just done yeah. one of our biggest deals ever in terms of condensed amount of time, huge deal, use some of the biggest influencers in the world all at the same time over the course of a weekend. And that deal came from people watching the vlog. The client watched the vlog. They came to us. They trusted us. They already felt like they knew us. And in the DD process, I'm sure all of those yes. guys were going to watch their content. There was it's a, guy, a really good way of finding out There was about a guy content. in the DD process who said, I can't listen to Panic at the Disco yes. without thinking yeah, about yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. And he was a vlog fan. <laughs> and he was leading the commercial DD. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, it's amazing the breadth of people that content as an agency or just creating content that's fun, that's relatable um, and hopefully informative. Um, can get you in all sorts of different walks of life from yeah receptionist at product firm to head of commercial DD at a, a due diligence business um, through to clients, brands, and sometimes people on the street, quite weirdly. And lots of members of our team are now, you know, in the company Slack are saying, oh, I got recognized walking to the shop this morning. It's great. It's, it's re we don't want it to be about us three. And I think people will see that in the new strands of content is that we're still trying to incorporate all the amazing characters in the team well 
this has been really enjoyable. Hopefully we'll be able to do this more often as a three of us, but I'm sure there'll be other guests as well. We get external, but also internal. Um, but no, it's been, it's been it's been lovely. I don't know how long we've been running for. Tom, how long have we been running for? 52. Not bad. We, Not said, bad. we said we'd do a half an hour to an hour. We've done pretty well. Um, thank you very much for listening, watching. Whether or not you're watching, this is a, a short clip, a, a full format, 52 minute uh, piece of content. Trust me when I say we are definitely back. We're creating daily content. I'm gonna put some pressure on the back. <laughs> Great daily content, all sorts of different formats. Won't just be the vlog, but we will try and do a vlog as well. Um, thank you very much for watching, listening, uh, and uh, we will see you soon.